Welcome back, guys. This is Alex Himes with The Ruckus. Thank you guys for tuning in. It's another wonderful Thursday here in Lexington. So, I'd like to start today off by talking to one of my very good friends today, Eddie Alderson. Eddie is an Emmy Award nominated uh, actor, a very good friend of mine from high school. He is currently in Philadelphia, a Philadelphia Eagles fan, unfortunately. And we're going to get his perspective on what's going on over in Philly these days. So, Eddie, how you doing, man? Alex, good to talk to you, buddy. How's it going? How's it going, Ed? It's been a minute. It's been a minute. I'm glad everything's well, man. Holy crap. And unfortunately... Great, man. <sighs> Eagles won the Super Bowl. Baby. Oh, get out of here with your Eagles winning the Super Bowl crap. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that. Too soon? Is it too soon already? Oh, man. It's been too soon since the moment it happened. Trust me. I was crying. Right. I don't think you understand. I like. I got up. My roommates were wondering what I was going to do because I was just pacing around the entire <clears> room <throat> like I was a madman or something. And the, I forget what John said, one of my roommates, and it set me off, and I threw my phone across the floor. <laughs> oh, man. Welcome to the life of an Eagles fan. Trust me. The, the misery has been insane over the years many many decades of misery but uh finally finally we have something to cheer about so yeah, finally something chance, to cheer about. Okay, Alex? oh come on man see i hate when people do that don't get me wrong i love being the person <laughs> to like sympathize with other people's teams when it's not my team like when the yeah. uh like when the saints won i'm like you know great for the city of new orleans great for the state they need it after katrina and everything they've gone through they definitely needed something to move them on and give them something like a bright spot to think about but here i am philly fans are enjoying it and i'm over here wondering well there's always next year <laughs> there's always next year. there is there is there's always next year that is true all right it's so i gotta ask different year i gotta ask how is the city responding to winning the super bowl you know, it's been really incredible. I mean, you know, obviously a lot of the, you know, national media will show, um, you know, the few knuckleheads that, you know, knock down light poles and, you know, break windows in stores. But, you know, I, I mean, the, the metropolitan area of, of surrounding Philly, you know, there's Delaware, there's, you know, parts of Maryland, Pennsylvania, South Jersey. I mean, these are, there's, this is like six million people who are diehard Eagles fans. And, you know, for the most part, it has been absolutely incredible. I mean, you know, at the parade the other day, they showed a guy who was spreading his father's ashes at the parade route because, you know, his father, you know, was an Eagles fan for over 70 years. You know, we won the national uh, championship. We won the championship in 1960, but that was before it was even called the Super Bowl. Yeah. So, I mean, for all these decades, I mean, my dad is 63, and he's never seen them win anything, and, you know, it's been really incredible. I mean, they're, you know, after 2004 losing the Super Bowl that year to the Patriots, this, this city uh, really took that hard. And, I mean, we went to the NFC Championship a few years in a row. But, fi I mean, finally it, it went our way. Finally something went our way. And I think, I think it still hasn't quite hit everybody yet. I mean, the parade happened, the season's over, but it's one of those things where it's like a pinch me dream kind of thing. Yeah, it almost doesn't even seem it, like to me. It doesn't even feel like the Super Bowl happened yet. In a strange way, what I mean by that is like you know it, the season just went by so quickly, and the end result with really them winning, did. like it, especially with something yeah. that nobody expected to happen. Like we're almost. I feel like I'm waking up every day. I'm just waiting for some like new football news to occur or something like that. You know? Yeah. Well, that's the thing is is nobody. I mean, that's kind of the story of you know it. it you know, the the whole story is kind of overshot by now. But the whole underdog story of the Eagles. I mean, to be honest, nobody gave them a chance at all. I mean, can you blame them though? They're lucky. People were saying they're lucky if they're seven and nine this season. People were saying the Giants and the Cowboys were going to run away with the division and all of this stuff. And I mean, every milestone, every challenge that came the Eagles' way, they kind of met. And to be honest, the same thing happened with the Patriots. I mean, after the Patriots started off rough at the beginning of the year, I mean, their defense couldn't stop anything those first few games. And, you know, Bill Belichick and Tom Brady, you know, they got it together. And I think both these teams were counted out too soon. And they both, you know, were triumphant and both had inc ended up having incredible seasons. 
I, I couldn't say it better myself, man. And this gets me to my next point. So we talk about how Belichick and Brady are so well, they, they just work so well together. And we all acknowledge that Belichick is a system. You can put X, Y, and Z quarterback or wide receiver in his system. And yeah, he makes them it time and time again. Yep. And this is something that I noticed with the Eagles as well. Like think about it with Carson Wentz. Although, yeah, you know, people undersold Nick Foles' value because of what went on with the Rams and his journey over time. But but realistically, I feel like if you inserted any quarterback in that system, really, like a Jacoby Brissett or a Jimmy G even, they could have been successful. It was more or less about the system as opposed to the quarterback. And that's nothing. That's not me taking anything away from Nick Foles and what he did. He played astoundingly well, much better than I anticipated, especially against the best quarterback to ever play the game of football. But it should say a lot, I think, about the Eagle system. I mean, would you agree that it's more or less the Eagle system as opposed to who they have running at quarterback? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, I don't think since he's uh, become a head coach in the league, I don't think people have given Doug Peterson enough credit for okay. the job that he's done. I mean, yeah, these. I mean, this guy, Mike Lombardi, I mean, came out in the beginning of the season and said that Doug Peterson was the worst coaching hire he has ever seen yep. in the history of the NFL and the least qualified person. I mean, if the things, I mean, the Eagles have lost, I mean, to put in perspective the job that Doug Peterson did this year, we lost our five team captains to season-ending injuries. We yep. lost Jason Peters, Jordan Hicks, Chris Maragos, Carson Wentz and Darren Sproles to season-ending injuries, and he still took them to the Super Bowl and, and won it. I mean, Doug Peterson, got, Doug Peterson got one vote for Coach of the Year, which I think is as, I mean, as much of a disgrace as anything. I mean, Doug Marone of the Jaguars got two votes. And Doug Peterson got one. I, don't get I me mean, wrong. It's is, nothing I mean, to take away. Absurd. It's nothing to take away. Okay, don't get me wrong. I completely agree with you that he doesn't get the respect he deserves. But if we're bringing uh, Jacksonville in it, look what they did in the playoffs. I mean, don't get me wrong. I completely understand because look at what Philly did on the off side. But did anyone think that we'd end up having a Vikings, Jaguars, Patriots, and Eagles being the last four teams that would be playing? Nobody. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, and and I, I think the NFL is definitely uh, glad that it ended up being an Eagles Patriots Super Bowl because you know if it ended up being a Minnesota versus Jaguars Super Bowl, uh, I, I I don't know if maybe five million people <laughs> would have watched that game. So I think yep. I think the NFL ratings were definitely uh, happy that it was Patriots Eagles. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's not like anyone would be watching. It's probably like three or four people would be watching that Super Bowl anyway. All right. Yeah, so true. this is my next big question for you. Since the Eagles played this well this season, do you see them actually pushing and making a return to the Super Bowl next year? Well, I mean, if you look at the history of the NFL, it is not easy at all to repeat as Super Bowl champions. I mean, it is not easy at all. But I, but I completely understand that, Eddie. Think about this year. That, I completely understand that. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I know. I know you do. It's a Patriots fan. Uh, but here's the thing. I mean, the Eagles have 20. I mean, the Eagles have over 20 of their starters under contract for next season. So pretty much it's, I mean, you know, obviously we lost Frank Reich, our offensive coordinator, which may change things up a bit in the coaching staff. Um, you know, the, the questions of Carson Wentz starting the season, uh, Nick Foles, you know, he's under a contract for another year, but do the Eagles move him or not? But I think that the key, the key pieces for the Eagles will be there next season. Now, you know, you don't get as long of an off season, so, you know, there's more wear and tear on your body playing longer. More Other teams get more rest than you do. So I think the, uh, I think the question is, is, you know, the, the Wentz and Foles uh, situation is, is going to be big and whether Wentz can get back. But I think the Eagles proved to be the best team, at least in the NFC East. You know, Ezekiel Elliott will come back. A few things went the Eagles' way this year in the NFC with Aaron Rodgers going down and Ezekiel Elliott. But I think overall, I mean, the Eagles have the best roster right now in the NFL. So I think, you know, there will be a couple pieces that may go to free agency, but for the most part, the core players will be there. It's just a, it's just a matter of execution. So I think I think we'll at least make a, a good run in the NFC. 
Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, I, I completely agree with you. I'd like to take a moment, though, to point out two things. Uh, actually, one thing, but two people, two of the people that helped guide the Eagles to the Super Bowl and ultimately win were Patriots that were on the Super Bowl winning team last year. Unfortunately, shout out to LeGarrette Blount and Chris Long, both doing very Absolutely. big things with the Eagles. Uh, I got to give them their due that in respect and whatnot, so I can't be that sour as a Pats <laughs> fan. Uh, although I am sour about Chris Long more than LeGarrette Blount, although I love him. Uh, so my next question, honestly, is with the play of Nick Foles in the Super Bowl and really down the stretch of the season, we got to see another dimensional quarterback who, if you look at the numbers, really had only a little bit better of ratings overall, both passer uh, completions, touchdowns, and interceptions than Carson Wentz. And it was just by a minute amount. And I understand that, you know, Carson has only been in the league oh so many years compared to Nick Foles, who's been around a little bit longer, but... This brings up the question, well, do you move Nick Foles then next season, capitalize while he has the highest value he's had in years, or do you run with it until Carson gets completely healthy, and if that's the case, what then? Well, you know, it's tough. I mean, people are saying, you know, what is the, I mean, the value for Nick Foles will never be higher than it is for right now. You will never get more more trade value for Nick Foles than he will right now. I mean, he's the reigning Super Bowl MVP. Yep. So whether that means could the Eagles get a first-round pick for him, you know, is a team who's desperate for a quarterback, like, you know, is a team like the Browns going to make a go for Nick Foles, or is a team like Denver, maybe the Jaguars or Denver, a team that's, you know, got a solid team that can make a run, but they're just maybe missing that, you know, top tier quarterback. Now, Nick Foles necessarily may not be a top tier quarterback, but he's the Super Bowl MVP and he just played, you know, the best games of his life the past six games. So, I, I mean, as an Eagles fan, I would, I, you know, this is Carson Wentz's team. I mean, I don't think there's any question of that. Carson Wentz is going to be the quarterback of the Eagles, barring any major injuries other than this one. He's going to be the Eagles quarterback for the next 10 to 15 years. So long term, this is Carson Wentz's team. But you know, it's it's a decision of whether you think the Eagles are really seriously contenders to repeat as champions next year. So do you do you keep Foles to try to win maybe those first three or four games if Wentz can't get back in time? And then once Wentz is healthy, then you bring him back. But I, I think the Eagles have some serious uh, serious decisions to make. I think you do take phone calls and see what you can get for him. Yeah, but try and field his value at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to see what the value is, and uh, I think, I think, I think you got to stay in win now mode. I mean, I don't think you really, you know, trade foals for anything less than a one or a two, and say, well, you know, we have five, you know, within the next year or so or next few years. I think you stay in win now mode and try to win as many games as you can next season. So I think you should keep foals and try to win those first few games and then let Wentz take over and maybe win win it again next year. I you see I happen to be in the same boat as you. I think that right now his value is the highest it will ever be and they should move him though before the season begins because you're not going to get higher than this. It's like how you get a car. As soon as you buy a car from a dealership and drive it off the lot, it loses half its value. As soon as the season yep. starts this year, he'll lose half his value immediately. They need to capitalize on what they were able to do with him now. Move him, maybe sign another backup quarterback who isn't as, you know, uh, great as Foles, but with, given their system and what they were able to do this postseason, I feel like they can incorporate, insert Joe, no, anybody, and still play and probably get maybe two or three of those games out of the four. And then you have Wentz, who's going to come back, and I honestly think he'll be completely fine. I think he'll come back from this injury and he'll be stronger than he was, maybe a step or two slower, but he'll still be at the top of his game. I think that the Eagles will be fine. I don't predict them making the Super Bowl next year, but that's just me as a hopeful Patriots fan, emphasis on hopeful. And, uh, yeah, I think that the Eagles are set for a good future before them. Uh, it's, it, it's unfortunate to say and admit, but I do think the Eagles are one of those teams that the NFL now has to be aware of because they're on the come up. And even though they already played well this year, they're still kind of on the come up. You know what I mean? Yeah, and they're a young team too. They're, they're they got a really young squad, and uh, you know our secondary. You know we have a lot of young young kids out there who played really well this season, and they're all under, most of them are under the age of twenty three. 
And yeah, the, so their you know, entire team is a young. Them. They're a young, young team. That's the best part for them. Honestly, I can't yeah. say it enough. They're young, they're talented, and they're still on the come up. Well, Ed, yep. I gotta say, honestly, man, I'm so glad that you were able to come on the show. Finally, we've been trying to get this to happen for a while. Unfortunately, I wish it was under better circumstances. <coughs> the Patriots winning the Super Bowl, but you know, neither here nor there. And I'm honestly, uh, I'm just, I'm glad that you're in good health and good spirits, man. And you know, I love you, and it's nothing but love. Alex, anytime, man. Anytime you, you want me to call in, anytime. I'm <laughs> happy to. And uh, before I go, I just have to say, fly, evil. Fly. Oh, get out of here with that trash. All right, Eddie, I love you, man. <laughs> All right, take care, buddy. Peace. All right, guys, we're going right now to the live show. Welcome back. We're trying to cause a ruckus. All right, so today for the regular live show today, I got a couple good stories for you. But first off, I'm going to jump straight to the NBA. And uh, today, I'm going to talk about the Cavaliers. So, who am I taking to win the East, the Cavs, or the field? And this is a question posed by First Take to its fans. So, with further ado, here it goes. The Cavaliers have one game under their belt, and all of a sudden they are the favorites to win the East by everyone. Don't get me wrong, I saw those trades, people. I understand why you would think that, but let's take a moment to recognize something. LeBron had a decent squad at the beginning of the season who he said he could roll and work with very well. Had that work out? Not too well, considering six of the guys that were brought in just got shipped out and moved along with draft picks. And they had to move those guys to get this team even just to be afloat. It was a sinking ship. And now all of a sudden, they are the favorites to win the East. Uh, don't get me wrong. I understand the Raptors are the perpetual playoff pretenders. And they're the regular season juggernauts. And it looks like they are that way this year. But I still got to give them a shout out and respect them. But most of all, and yes, I'm the freaking biased fan right here. It's the Boston Celtics that we got to respect and we got to pay attention to. They're at 40 wins. They're second in the East. I understand that. They're on a game, on a losing skid, but none of this matters. And let me tell you something. None of it matters for one reason. It really comes down to the games after the All-Star break. That's when all these teams will have time to refresh, get used to each other. Same with the Cavaliers. Same thing with the Celtics. Everyone will have time to gel again, mesh, take their minds off of what's going on in the regular season, and they can get back to business. You know, incorporating four new guys on the Cavaliers roster isn't going to be easy. And I understand that first game, really, they showed up and they showed out. I loved seeing it. Uh, at the expense of my Celtics, I loved seeing those moves for the Cavaliers work out because it sends a message from Kobe Altman to the rest of the league saying that although I'm a novice GM and I'm young, I can still get it done. And look what he did. He moved players that we didn't think he would move. He made big, bold moves. And I, uh, I'll i get into it later about the whole Isaiah Thomas and then taking on Jordan Clarkson's contract, which kind of surprised me. Uh, but they're doing it all and they're going all in with, right now with LeBron. They're trying to send him a message saying, we're going all in with you. We want you here beyond this year and we're going to make that happen. So they got a bunch of young guys, especially Rodney Hood. I want to take a moment to note Rodney Hood is a special talent who got sold low by the Jazz and the Cavaliers won that trade with them in particular because of that deal. Rodney Hood is a special player for them. And although he's going to make a big difference, I'm not ready to declare the Cavs number one in the East. I'm not ready to declare anyone else number one in the East until they finally play the Celtics in a series in the playoffs and show otherwise. The Celtics are still one of the best defensive teams in the NBA. Sure, they're struggling offensively right now, but that happens. You go through offensive slumps. Some of their guys are banged up and injured, and right now it's also a psychological thing. This is still the first season of incorporating so many new guys, of which only four of the people from last uh, year returned. You know, this team is playing without Gordon Hayward, and they still were number one for a very long time. That's their supposed best player that they had on this roster was Gordon Hayward, and they were still number one for this long. You can't hold it against them. They're going to be number one, I think, by the end of the season. I think they're going to go in the playoffs and play a very good stretch against these teams. And I think the Cavaliers, actually, with these trades, it pushed them to the Eastern Conference Finals, where they will play the Boston Celtics and lose. And that's just my opinion on that one. So going right into the next take, i got to talk about the NBA trade deadline. And i got three takes on that. Three, three hot takes on that. Malik, what you think about those hot takes? Doesn't care because he looked down. So we're going with the biggest surprise. Of course, right back to the Cavaliers cleaning house. 
Out goes Dwayne Wade, Isaiah Thomas, Jay Crowder, Iman Shumpert, Channing Fry, Derrick Rose, and a first-round pick from the Cavs, and they were able to do it. They got younger, and in one sentence, they acquired a rim protector and monster dunker, an instant second unit offense, a defensive-minded point guard, and a well-rounded score and player who should become the starter at some point. And by should, I'm talking about Rodney Hood becoming the starter of the Cleveland Cavaliers over J.R. Smith. You know, we got one good game for a sample of it. I'm, I understand. I'm excited to see how this team plays out for the rest of the year, too. Just like every other fan of the NBA is, especially Cavaliers fans right now. And they'll be the first to tell me, ha, 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 look what we got. Well, put hold the brakes. Let's see how this works out. And like I said in the last take, it pushes them to the Eastern Conference Finals. But it definitely was a big surprise that Altman was able to put together those deals all so well together. A three-team trade, moving multiple players with multiple teams, moving out six guys and bringing in four. That's not easy, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. And for a young GM to do this, it's even all the more impressive. All right, so my second take is my biggest WTF. And that goes to the Orlando Magic. Orlando shipped out Alfred Payton to the Suns in exchange for a second round pick. You heard that right. Alfred Payton, their starting point guard, was shipped out to the Phoenix Suns in exchange for a second round pick. Oh, I'm getting a headache. Payton averaged 13 points per game, 6.3 assists per game, and 4 rebounds a game this season alone. Overall, 11 points per game, and his stats were a little bit lower than that. But nonetheless, he's still a very good point guard. He just needs to shave his hair. Shave his head or cut his hair because he's blocked his own shot five times a season, and I can think of the highlights right here. And this leaves DJ Augustine and Shelvin Mack as the only point guards on the Magic roster. The only point guards on the Magic roster are Shelvin Mack and DJ Augustine. I love DJ Augustine every now and then. Well, not really at all, actually. Never mind. I don't like the fact that they traded out Peyton for almost nothing. And Phoenix clearly needed a new point guard after Isaiah Cannon went down with that horrific knee injury. Oh, uh, leg injury. Shout out to Isaiah Cannon. Best prayers to you, man. He already dropped 19 points and 29 points against the Nuggets and the Dubs. Phoenix stole this one. They won that trade easily. And it shouldn't have happened on their account. So my last big, big topic for the trade deadline is who won the deadline. Of course, everyone's going to say the Cleveland Cavaliers. Well, the Los Angeles Lakers, much to my chagrin, won the NBA trade deadline by moving Larry Nance Jr., Jordan Clarkson to the Cavaliers in exchange for Isaiah Thomas, Channing Frye, and the Cavs' first-round pick. This is great for the Lakers in every way, shape, or form. How might you ask? Well, for Isaiah Thomas in particular, this is his best opportunity to showcase his value before hitting the free agent market because he will be the focal point offensively and have the ball in his hands, which he lacked in Cleveland, showing that you know him and LeBron couldn't work because he's a ball-dominant guard. They needed to move him out. They did, and now Isaiah is going to play very well for the Lakers, and it's going to make him look that much better, especially because it's only three to four months until the free agency period hits. I mean, makes sense, right? And for the Lakers, this is a two-fold win. This is an, a win in every way, shape, or form. They shipped off Clarkson without adding a pick to his contract, which surprised me because myself and like most other people who follow the NBA would think they would have to add something to his contract to move him. Beyond this, they move Larry Nance, giving guys like Kyle Kuzma and now officially Julius Randle more time on the court and guaranteeing them a spot on the roster. And I think this goes even more so for Julius because we've all been hearing about will he won't be traded, whatnot, will he be a part of the Lakers' future. I think this trade alone signifies that he is definitely a part of the Lakers' fans long, uh, plans long term. They cleared massive cap space to use in this free agency period as well as next summer, 2018 and 2019. We all hear about them trying to sign guys like LeBron or Paul George. Well, they just made it that much more possible for it to happen. This, I gotta say, is the biggest part of it all. They were able to convince the team that LeBron James is on to take on more money in a trade when they know that the Lakers, the team that isn't, that's on the other side of the coast, that's a beautiful place where everyone thinks LeBron James is going to sign this free agency period, they took money from them. They helped the team that could conceivably sign away their best player, the best player in the NBA. 
which tells me they're clearly confident LeBron is going to stay. And if he doesn't, well, they're just going to look back at this and realize the Lakers won this trade. And I think it's definitely one of those trades where down the road we realize the Lakers won this trade not only at the trade deadline and for that season, but ultimately for seasons to come. So last two takes I'm going to give today. I want to take a quick moment to talk about Paul Pierce joining the Rafters and the lore of Celtic greats. Congratulations to my favorite player to ever don the green uniform, to ever step on a court, to ever take the most beautiful step back jumper I've ever seen. Paul Pierce on joining the retired number club of the Boston Celtics. Number 34 will never be worn again. Will be seen in the rafters for years to come. And I want to talk about three points from that Paul Pierce. My favorite memory. Game 10. Yeah, game 10. Game 3 of the Eastern Conference uh, first round of the playoffs. 2010. Miami. Paul Pierce drains the most beautiful step back jumper at the end of regulation to get the Celtics the lead and win the game and ultimately win the series in five. I remember watching that jumper as it happened, wearing my Pierce jersey and then stepping back and making the exact same play over and over again in practice for practically five, six years because of how obsessed I was with that play. I used to do that in my driveway all the time. Second, my in-person memory with Paul Pierce actually occurred. Uh, we've met a couple of times. I doubt he remembers me, but you know, it's nice. Uh, I was heading back to LA uh, and I was stuck on a layover in Atlanta and I'm clearly not in the right headspace uh, in what is now recreational in California. I was a little uh, under the influence of cannabis marijuana and I'm standing there and all of a sudden I see a guy to my right sitting down wearing this hoodie, gray hoodie I might emphasize black shades and headphones on and i knew who it was i've seen him on tv i've seen him in person too many times to not recognize who that man was and it was paul pierce of course he's sitting there right at the terminal eating wings stop like there's no tomorrow and this box was filled with wings at one part had like 10 wings left and the other side had like 20 bones right there and i'm standing there and i'm going in between in my head all while i'm staring at him mind you those wings look really good, and I don't know what to say to my favorite player of all time. So I slowly creep towards him. I look at him, and I'm kind of looking at the wings too, and I'm like, those are really good wings, huh? And he looks at me and chuckles, because I'm pretty sure he knew what was up, and said, yeah. And then I said, you're the man, Paul, and walked away. Couldn't think of anything else to say. Couldn't think of the right words to formulate and give to him, and just, I, I was too caught up in the moment. And uh, it was just, it was way too funny. He had to be there, I guess. And then my last part of this is I've always felt like Pierce's career at the very end when the Celtics won the championship really paralleled where I was growing up. And what I mean by that is growing up and trying to figure out who I was as a person and an individual, Paul Pierce started winning those games and became a member of the Big Three, or the Big Three joined him uh, in Boston right around that same time. So it was just that much more influential of, him and who he was as a man on my life and ultimately now what I'm doing in my career. I get to talk about these guys all the time. I get to talk about the guys I loved watching as a kid. There is not a greater blessing than doing what you love and talking about those you loved watching as a kid. And I can't begin to tell you I'm blessed. And today I want one more piece of news. I'll give it to you guys. Malik is looking really bleak right now. Doesn't really want to keep doing this, but I'll talk about it. So we're going to talk about Joe Johnson. And I know it might not seem like a big deal, but Joe Johnson just committed to joining the Houston Rockets after receiving a buyout from the Sacramento Kings because everybody in their right mind would want to buy out from the Sacramento Kings if they got stuck on that roster. Uh, Johnson holds a 16.2 point per game average. Of course, he's not the same guy that signed that ridiculous $205 million deal with the Hawks way back when, but he's still a 7.3 points per game uh, score with 3.3 rebounds, and that was with Utah this season alone coming off the bench. The man will be an X factor for Houston. What I mean by that is he adds another clutch score down the road of the game that can be trusted and relied upon to make the big shots when needed and when necessary. Johnson is one of my favorite guys to watch every now and then because he kind of reminds me a little bit of Pierce, just a little bit slower. And that jumper is just so silky smooth. And the way he shoots, it's just, it, there's something about him and shooting. It might just be back in the day when he was a part of the Hawks, how you'd hear Joe Johnson for three. 
I'm doing a terrible impression of the Hawks uh, voiceover guy, but he does a great job doing it himself. Anyway, Johnson will be a very big X factor for the Rockets. I count on him being a part of the clutch time unit, which is the, la the last members of the starting five who will be on the floor towards the end of the game. Although he'll be backing up the likes of Gordon and Green, who are backing up James Harden, and Ariza and Tucker at small forward, Joe Johnson is better than all those guys other than... Uh, uh, James Harden in my mind, so I would definitely have him on the floor with Paul, Harden, Ariza, Johnson, and Clint Capella or uh, Ryan Anderson. I think that it's definitely going to add another dimension to this Houston team who's getting ready for the All-Star break and afterward we're really going to get to see how he affects their team come uh, post-All-Star break games and I think that it'll be a very big deal, guys. Well, guys, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in today. It's been a pleasure. I'd like to thank my special guest, Eddie Alderson, for coming on the show. Big Eagles fan, unfortunately, but it's all right, ladies and gentlemen. We'll catch you next week on the Ruckus.